laid low, while old Marjoram sleeps. Matilda Fisher is still in Breggersland. Her family still claims the territory is the free Breggers, and she's been profligate with her promises to the households who've remained in the conquered territory. There's talk of a council of stewards to advise the woman who seems to be planning to rule as queen in all but name. She sent out Fisher storytellers to spread twisted tales of Breggersland's past, casting Tom Drake as a betrayer who betrayed the household to the Empire during the Cousins' War. Their stories are pernicious, casting the Fishers who quit their homes to hide out in the Western Marshes, who fled to Hordaland as valiant heroes rather than defeated traitors. Some listen, most don't. There are too many orcs in Breggersland for most Breggers to lend more than half an ear to tales of courageous Fishers here to liberate their kin from the Imperial yoke. That said, the Empire might have underestimated how much trouble old Bushel Sykes would cause in the long run. He's never been popular, a dour Breggers of infamously sour temperament, but his family line goes far back into the distant past of the territory, and it's said the dark waters of the Fenlands runs in his veins. Before Matilda Fisher came to Breggersland, he's never had a good word for anyone. That's changed recently. Old Marjoram stayed asleep in her swamp, so he's succeeded in helping the Jotun expand the Ottaway. It's been transformed from a driveway just about wide enough for a couple of wagons to a major causeway that can easily take twenty soldiers walking abreast. If that was the extent of his treachery, it would be bad enough, but there's more to it than that. He's rounded up a force of beaters and dropped poisoned words into their ears, encouraging them to share their fen law with the fishers and their orc allies. They're no match for House Greywater or the Strong Reeds, but in the wake of the winter solstice they're getting closer to rooting out some of the hidden places the good marchers are using to lay low. Worse still, he's been going from household to household with stolen Lau, sowing the seeds of loyalty wherever he finds someone who shares his views about the Empire. By all accounts, Bushel is no great friend of the Fishers, or the Jotun, but while he may not like them, he absolutely despises the Empire. Folk who might not give Matilda Fisher and her clan the time of day are much more receptive to his argument that the Marches made a mistake, and should have told the First Empress they'd have none of us at the start. For all that he's good with venomous words and a sack of lao, he's just one man. The real power in Breggersland remains the Jotun, there at the behest of Matilda Fisher. They're busy extending the Ottaway even more, in the weeks after the winter solstice, stretching the new construction down towards Graven Rock. Perhaps they think that by linking it to proper solid ground it'll make it more effective. More likely, with Liathavan under their control, it's about making it easier to transport white granite into the Fenlands so they can start properly fortifying the territory. Whatever the facts are, the one thing they don't do is invade Mitwold. Probably they expect the Empire to be waiting for them if they follow through on their telegraph move immediately. Mitwold isn't going anywhere though, they have time, surely. The flaw in their strategy, if that is what they expect, is that the Empire doesn't wait for them to invade Mitwold. How do they rise up, rise up high? The Strong Reeds, working with the Patriots of House Greywater, have been laying low in Breggersland taunting the Jotun, impeding the fishers and their orc allies at every turn and making it impossible for the Jotun to secure the territory, ensuring the Empire stays abreast of what the invaders have been up to. With the aid of those beaters who have not let old Bushel Sykes fill their heads with empty promises and lies, they've been preparing to strike, and that time has come. At the General's command, they rise up. All across Breggersland, they and their allies strike at key targets, garrisons, roads, stores, and the households of Matilda's supporters. Among others, they are aided by almost every independent captain currently active in the marches, by beaters equipped with supplies from nearly every farm in the nation, by the soldiers of households still loyal to the marches, gathered by one Tom of Otterley, a marcher rescued from the fishers during the winter solstice by the young heroes of the academy. There is also magic at work. Warriors drawn from the realm of the Lady of Penance by Imperial magicians appear overnight once the strong reeds begin their attack, enthusiastically aiding the mortal marchers in their assault. It makes for a strange contrast, glorious knights from the fields of glory in shining plate alongside mud-stained marcher soldiers and crafty beaters in vicious fights across the Dower Fens. At the same time the strong reeds rise up, their allies cross the river from Westmarch and lay siege to Matilda's forces at Fisher's Rock. Thanks to the disciplined scouts of the Tusks and the far-sighted seers of the Fist of the Mountain, the timing is nearly perfect. Just as the Fishers realise the strong reeds have arisen, they have a much more pressing problem right on their doorstep. The Jotun forces are concentrated in the south, securing the borders with Mitwold. Some of the Mandolas Raw are stationed in North Fens, advisers to the Fishers apparently, but the majority of their forces are focused on the project to expand the Ottaway, around Ottery and Sallow. The Fishers try desperately to cling to Fishers Rock, but it soon becomes clear it's fruitless. 
Even with the Jotun armies mobilising to provide their support, they have little chance of holding against eight Imperial armies, especially when two of those armies are the Drakes in the Summer Storm. Fisher's Rock falls. After the initial confusion, the Jotun rally, their armies moving to support their human allies. Battle rages across the Fens, and it quickly becomes clear that the defenders are outmatched by the Empire's sheer number and by their commitment to the attack. Blood, mud, and fire. When the Jotun first came, when they first conquered Bregisland for Matilda Fisher, they threw their entire strength towards their goal, and so it is with the Empire. This is an overwhelming assault. The Drakes and the Fist of the Mountain in the Vanguard eager to face the Yagara and their Jotun allies. As always, the Winterfolk fight heroically, matching the honour of the Jotun. Fewer orcs die, but they are more able to claim territory from the invaders. If Wintermark is careful to avoid needless slaughter, this is more than made up for by the Navarre Vesalia's dance. Their envenomed weapons may kill quickly, and without undue suffering, but they still kill. Even a nick from one of their spears can be enough to leave a fisher or a Jotun weak or paralysed, or thin their blood so that they die swiftly of other wounds. The Summer Storm, the Tusks and the Freeborn of the Fire of the South are more balanced in their strategies. While the Imperial Orcs are empowered with supernatural clarity that makes them head off their foes with a balanced attack, the other two armies adopt strategies that make good use of the number of physics, chirurgeons and masters of healing magic that accompany them. A wise decision, given the risk of sickness and infection that fighting in the Fens presents. At the forefront of all this, though, are a new army. Brightly dressed warrior freeborn, blazing with the flames of a legacy reborn, the burning falcons seem to be everywhere at once, seeking every opportunity to engage the descendants of the Jotun orcs who once destroyed their forebears in battle. The mud and dark water should make short work of their bright yellows, their brilliant oranges and their crimson cloth, but it seems almost as if the Fens dare not sully their finery. A rumour spreads quickly that they can literally charge across open water, a story that while ridiculous makes the fishers loath to face them. Not so the Jotun, they seem to relish the opportunity to fight the Burning Falcon, and some clearly recognising the Bird of Prey banners engaging them for preference wherever they have the opportunity. The fall is not a small one. North Fens is liberated almost before the defenders know what is happening. The fight for Grey Fens is more drawn out, but no less decisive. The fishers are scattered, the Jotun driven back. They defend as best they can, but it is clear pretty quickly which way the battle is going to go. The Jotun do not like fighting in the marshes, which sometimes give the advantage to Imperial soldiers with their solid beater support. Often enough, however, the Orcs have the advice of their own beaters, both traitor marcher and fisher, and keen-eyed scouts who help them to find good defensible positions in the mire. After Grey Fens, the Imperial advance slows a little. The Jotun are more comfortable fighting in the rushes in the Ottermire. There are more settlements here, more solid ground for them to plant their heavily armoured feet on, firmer soil for them to fix their banners in. The Fellhammers and the Mandolas Roar take on the brunt of the Empire's attacks. General Yakan of the Fellhammers takes particular pains to engage the Imperial Orcs, but where they are not present they seem to relish the opportunity to match blades with the soldiers of the Marches. They take few pains to support the Fishers. By all accounts the Fellhammers have been the most critical of the Jotun about the alliance with the humans, calling for the Jotun to conquer the Marches for themselves. The other two armies, the ferocious champions of the Roaring Thunder and the more mystic Ulvenoir and Rathlost of the Howling Knight, seem to have a little more respect for humans that fight alongside them, supporting them wherever they can, for all the good it does. As the Spring Equinox approaches, Matilda Fisher's dreams of free Bregas are in tatters. The Empire controls the Fens, the Rushes, and has occupied parts of Ottermire. The Jotun are regrouping near Graven Rock. Her warriors are scattered. Fisher's Rock is firmly in the hands of the Imperial armies. Many of those fair-weather households who are prepared to pay lip service to her conquest of the Bregas have welcomed the marcher armies in particular with open arms. And yet, despite all of that, she refuses to give up. The call goes out for those who still support the dream of a free Bregas to gather beneath her blue eel banners in preparation for a retreat. There is no talk of surrender, no talk of abandoning her claim to be the rightful steward of Bregas land. Perhaps, given her stubbornness, she really is a marcher at heart. Her ambitions have come at a high price again. On top of all those who have died since she first pressed her claim to Bregas Land, an estimated 4,000 fighters have fallen in battle. The final number may prove to be much higher. Most of the dead fell to the weapons of their foes, a few to the quagmires and deceptive waters, and the vicious wildlife of the fens. The lion's share of those deaths are on the Imperial side. The Jotun have fought to defend and to preserve their strength in the face of the Empire's reckless, forceful assault. In many cases, the bodies of the dead are lost, claimed by the marches. The Fens embrace fallen humans and orcs, slain Imperials, free Bregas and Jotun, the courageous and the treacherous, with equal uncaring indifference. 
Game information. Bregger's Land is an Imperial territory once again. During the Spring Equinox, it will be up to the Imperial Senate as to which nation to assign the Dow Fens. Matilda's Fisher's hold on the territory has been broken, but with the help of traitors such as Old Bushel Sykes, she has managed to cling to some of her support among some of the Bregisland households. If she is able to retreat out of Bregisland with her allies, she will remain a powerful threat during any future Jotun invasion of the Dow Fens. Work on the Otterway was completed before the Imperial Salt, so in theory the region of Odmire is still under threat of invasion. Participation the experience of fighting in close proximity with the Knights of Glory can be particularly inspirational, especially one already has a trace of summer magic in their blood. Any changeling character whose military unit supported the strong reeds may choose to begin the next event experiencing a role-playing effect. You are filled with confidence. Nothing is beyond you if you put your mind to it. Now is the time to act, to pursue your goals you have been neglecting. Anyone who questions your prowess must be taught a quick lesson about the foolishness of doubting you. Such characters may also use their experience of fighting alongside the Knights of Glory to permanently increase the strength of their lineage. This effect is particularly pronounced for changelings of the marches whose military unit supported the strong reeds if they also have the hero skill. As long as they continue to roleplay appropriately, they will have an additional temporary hero point that they can use during the Spring Equinox events. Once this hero point is spent or once the event ends, the bonus hero point is gone. It is not an increase to the character's maximum hero points. Please bear in mind that these opportunities are only available to these specific characters. You are free to roleplay you were present, as always, but you do not qualify for the additional hero point unless your military unit supported the strong reeds this season. Battle Opportunity A major conjunction of the Sentinel Gate has been identified that will allow the heroes of the Empire to reach Bregersland during the upcoming Spring Equinox. Details of the conjunction are being prepared by the Civil Service but it is believed to involve a chance to end the ambitions of Matilda Fisher once and for all.